Hi, this is uh, chapter 23, the lymphatic system or the lymphoid system. And we're beginning with a cartoon here. Um, he says, I am not beloved, I don't need to be. I filter old blood, I fight bacteria. I am silent protector, I am spleen. We don't hear a lot about the spleen, which is probably why the artist here thought to make them a silent protector. But that's what they do. The, the spleen filters old blood cells and he fights bacterial infections. He um, filters the blood. So let's take a look at our lymphatic system, which the spleen is part of. So if you look at the functions of the lymphatic system, we see number one, fluid balance. So this is a slide that really looks at the incredible amount of fluid that moves through the lymphatic system and what happens when the lymphatic system is not working to move that fluid. So the word lymphedema, uh, edema, E-D-E-M-A, that is uh, the clinical word for swelling. So anytime you have swelling in your body, it's a form of edema. The cause of it, right, that can be different, but um, in, in terms of lymph edema, this is the improper drainage of lymph. Lymph, you guys, is fluid. So like when we say blood, we know blood is a fluid. Lymph is also a fluid, it's a different kind of fluid. And it moves within uh, vessels, lymphatic vessels of our body. It's also found, um, it's basically from our tissues or the tissue fluid can go into the lymphatic system and become lymph. But if you have uh, vessels that are not moving that lymph around your body, that fluid stays within your tissues and you get swelling. So this, uh, here is a very dramatic um, sort of look at what can happen with lymphedema. If you don't move the lymph and it stays within the tissues of your body, you can have extreme swelling. There's different stages of lymphedema, but you can see that it can be really crippling, the amount of fluid that can stay within the, the muscle or your, your tissues. So uh, the lymphatic system plays a big role in uh, returning that fluid, recycling the fluid, and moving it throughout your body. Um, we'll take a look at the vessels involved there, but that's lymphedema. Sometimes it's a genetic anatomical malform, um, malformed vessels that can cause lymphedema. Other times it can be caused by um, a parasite or some kind of physical trauma, um, but that's lymphedema. So that's number one, fluid balance. Uh, number two, it produces and matures your lymphocytes. So there's a role. Remember lymphocytes is your T and B cells. So it matures uh, your T and B cells. It will also um, act as to absorb lipids from your intestines. And I really speak about this again in the digestive system. So we'll look at the word lacteal again in the digestive system. But for now, you need to know that that does have a role in absorbing the lipids, lipids being fats and cholesterol. And the lymphatic system is an alternate route for transport. So we talked about the blood, right? The vascular system, our blood vessels, as being a primary route of transport for substances throughout your body. But the lymphatic system is also another route. So let's take a look at the picture here of the lymphatic system. It's a network of vessels that you can see in green. And the textbooks like to use green for lymphatic. And um, we have various not, uh, sort of nodes that are found uh, throughout your body as well. So lymph vessels, lymph nodes. We have the spleen here. The largest organ of the lymphatic system is the spleen. And then we're gonna have um, your tonsils in your throat, the thymus here, the thymus gland. Uh, and then we have areas of your digestive tract. So this little S-shaped thing, that's a little piece of your intestines to show you that there are um, areas that are considered part of your lymphatic system within the walls of your intestines, and they're called malt. We'll talk about that too. All right, so let's take a look at um, the lymphatic capillaries. All right, so your lymphatic capillaries are going to be right next to your blood, right? Your vascular capillaries. So here we look at, this is a capillary bed. This should look familiar, right? And the arrows are pointing to the fluid that is moving from your blood out of your capillaries into the tissue, right? So the purple, the light purple color, this is your tissue. You should know that the fluid, when it does become part of your tissues and surrounds the cells of your tissue, that's called interstitial fluid. It's also called tissue fluid. So interstitial fluid or tissue fluid 
is fluid that is between the cells of your tissue. So this could be an organ, like your liver, or it can be a muscle, but your, you know, your organs have fluid within them and around the cells. So that's interstitial fluid. Now, since the blood is always going to be delivering fluid to your tissues, your tissues have to return that fluid, right? There needs to be an exit. So predominantly the fluid is going to go into the lymphatic system. So you have these capillaries that are taking up that tissue fluid or the interstitial fluid and moving it out into the lymphatic system and it will eventually return to the blood. Okay. The capillary end of your, sorry, the venous end of your capillaries also take in some fluid. So the um, sort of exit of interstitial fluid is predominantly from your lymphatic capillaries. They go into the lymphatic capillaries, but also some here. So it's not marked with an arrow since we're talking about the lymphatic system. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, your notes here. What are the uh, hallmark signs of a lymphatic capillary or the anatomical characteristics. So just like your blood capillaries, they're made of simple squamous cells and the adjacent edges of those cells overlap. So this is a difference. Let me show you the other picture here. So we're looking at this detail here, or we can look at this detail right here. Um, or, you know, you can see that image here too. So notice that the cells, when they come together, they don't, um, they're not sealed end to end but actually there's a little bit of an overlap where they, it's kind of like a one-way door. It's like a swinging door that only opens one way. So this is a really important anatomical feature of your lymphatic capillaries because it allows for the fluid, right? This interstitial fluid to enter into the capillary network more easily, but also allows for larger cells to come in because it's sort of an open path, an open door into the lymphatic capillaries. So things like white blood cells, bacterial cells, um, you know, lots of, you know, debris and pathogens, you actually want those, um, you know, abnormalities, the cells from your tissue, you want them to go into the lymphatic system because the lymphatic system is made to catch um, any pathogens that might be in the tissue because eventually the fluid that enters into the lymphatic capillary will get routed into a lymph node. And those lymph nodes are basically full of white blood cells and it screens that fluid, that lymph, as it comes into the lymph node. And anything that's uh, foreign in there will you know, be caught by your lymph nodes. And so it basically screens your fluid inside the lymphatic vessels, which is gonna be called lymph, right? Once that fluid comes into the lymphatic vessels, it's now called lymph. So it's called, again, it's called interstitial fluid in your, in your tissues, but then you change the name to lymph once that fluid moves into the lymphatic system, okay, into the capillaries and the vessels. So that's our first big difference between blood capillaries and our lymphatic capillaries is that the lymphatic capillaries will have these overlapping um, cells that create a one-way opening into the capillary network and then the pressure from inside here will close the door. Okay, so um, other features that you wanna know is that they have a blind end. So the, unlike your vascular network, unlike your blood vessels, your blood vessels don't ever end because it's basically, let's go back here, right? The arterial end becomes a capillary, the capillary bed just folds right into a venule. So there's no start and stop of your blood vessels but there is a blind end of your lymphatic vessels. Okay, so let's move on to this. So there's a blind end, and then it has a larger diameter. That should make sense to sort of take in the fluid from your tissues, um, take in also uh, larger cells that might enter into the lymphatic tissues. They have thin walls to be permeable. Okay, the endothelium lacks a continuous basal lamina, again, to be more permeable. They are flat or irregular in their outline because they are so thin walled that they tend to be a little bit irregular shaped. Um, and uh, yeah, so number five, the anchoring filaments keep these uh, flap doors open so that fluid is readily taken up into those lymphatic capillaries. Okay, and then number five is more permeable, which I mentioned before. Okay, so once the fluid enters, you see here, 
the blood capillary, the fluid exit, it becomes interstitial fluid, the fluid flows into the lymphatic capillaries. All right, um, let's take a look at this picture. So this is just a, a image, just, you know, another illustration of the same thing. So this is capillary bed drainage by the lymphatic capillary. So we can see that here, this white structure is a lymphatic capillary taking up all the extra fluid that surrounds the tissue cells, right? So those pink guys with the blue dot, those are just cells of the tissue. And we have <clears throat> the blood, right? So the little red dots, that's the, your blood cells, your capillaries, right? Or here's your capillary bed, and then here it moves on to a venule. But we see that if you lose or you disrupt your local lymphatic system, then you don't have that exit route for that extra interstitial fluid. And we can see that extra fluid building up within the tissue. Okay, so you can't, so back up to this. So sometimes I have the question where, well, why can't you just sort of, you know, poke a hole and just let it drain, right? That's not how this works because it's kind of like a soggy sponge. If you have a soggy sponge, you can't just cut the end of the sponge and act, uh, you know, expect all the water to just leak out with the one side. Your tissues are a sponge. So in order to move this fluid out and, and, and back into circulation, you have to massage and squeeze and compress, which is the therapy for this. You have to massage, they wear compression socks, massaging the fluid. So it's a, a constant battle with that fluid because your, your blood is constantly putting the fluid into your tissue fluid, in your tissues. Okay, so moving on. So once we have our capillary, um, you know, sort of getting that fluid at first, then the lymph will flow into larger vessels. So here, to larger lymphatics. So here's what the lymph vessel looks like. The lymph vessels will travel along your blood vessels and they're gonna be built similarly to your blood vessels. They have the same three tunics as your blood vessels, but they're thinner. Uh, the lumens are actually larger than arteries or veins. <clears throat> and as the fluid moves through, it they have valves, right? So there's no pump to pump the lymph through your lymph vessels. So it relies on the same method that your veins do to move the lymph through your body. So it relies on skeletal muscle contraction. And your lymphatic vessels have valves just like your veins do so that you ensure the one way um, passage of fluid. So every time your muscles contract, it'll compress your lymphatic vessels. The lymph will move, but only in one direction because it cannot go backwards because there's a valve at the end. Let me show you a special feature though. At the base of every valve, so when there is a valve in a lymphatic vessel, you have a bulge. The vessel actually enlarges a little bit, and that's to allow more fluid to build up in this area right by the valve so that you can um, close the valve uh, more efficiently. So if you didn't have a lot of fluid there, the, the valve might be a little bit leaky, but if you have more fluid here, it closes the valve. So you have a, a little bulge uh, where you have the valve, and so your lymphatic vessels will actually look like beads on a string. So there's a bead, there's a bead, there's a bead, there's a bead. Those are where all the valves are. You can see we're leading up to a very large entity. This is a lymph node, okay? So we're gonna look at that in just a second. But um, let's look at the number three. So under lymph vessels, letter B in your outline, number three, the path of your body fluid. So this is just to reinforce what we just went through. So your blood capillaries will bring that fluid in your blood, which we call plasma, right? When the plasma leaves your capillaries and goes into your tissue, it's called tissue fluid, otherwise known as interstitial fluid, right? When that interstitial fluid or tissue fluid moves into your lymphatic capillaries, then we call it lymph. Lymph then moves from the capillaries to your vessels. The vessels will move through one or several nodes so at least two nodes. So there's this lymph node. You can see the lymph node after the lymph travels through that, it goes and it connects to another lymph node. And ultimately, where does that lymph travel to? Uh, their last sort of um, vessels are called trunks. And then there are two ducts in the body. And then we, then we empty the lymph into the venous bloodstream. So that fluid that initially came from your blood 
moved into your tissues, that tissue fluid moved all the way through your lymphatic system, going through several lymph nodes, getting screened and getting cleaned, right? So we have sterile lymph as we go and put it back into the venous blood system. So we'll look at exactly where this happens. But I just want to get the flow of the, um, this fluid through our body, right? And again, we're doing this movement with the muscles, with our muscles of the body. So this is the reason if you're on a long plane ride or if you're just sitting down for a very long time, you haven't moved your body, you might notice that your feet or your ankles have gotten swollen, right? Because you haven't contracted the muscles of your feet, your toes to move that fluid out. So for whatever, a couple hours, if you're sitting on a plane, right? You're not moving your feet, your the lymph is actually, or the tissue fluid is accumulating and accumulating and you need to get up and walk around and squeeze your muscles and exercise a little bit to get that lymph um, moving again to get it back into your bloodstream. So that's why you have that swelling happen if you're sort of immobile for a long time. All right, so this is where we have the, um, the ducts. So I'm not gonna have you guys memorize the trunks, but I will have you know the two ducts where lymph is returned back into the venous blood supply. So there's only two, okay? Look at the picture here. So you have um, the thoracic duct, okay? This thoracic duct here on the left side of your body drains the lymph from almost every part of your body except for the right side above the diaphragm. So this little section here, that's their diaphragm. So above the diaphragm to the right, that's the lymph that drains into this right lymphatic duct. And on the left side, called the thoracic duct, drains the rest of your body, okay? And look at the position. So the fluid that is in your toes, that's in your legs and your thighs and your arms, it has to travel all the way to right above your heart, right into the chest to move into the bloodstream. And if you look at this carefully, it's pretty much at the junction of your internal jugular and your brachiocephalic vein right there. Same position here. Really, it's the, the subclavian actually right here. Oh, I'm sorry, I said brachiocephalic, subclavian. So internal jugular and subclavian. There you go. Okay, so those are our two ducts where the lymph drains back into our bloodstream. Now we're gonna look at a lymph node. All right, lymph nodes are found all throughout your body. Um, the only place that you don't have lymph nodes are your central nervous system. So the uh, brain and spinal cord don't have lymph nodes. But you can see that we have lymphatic vessels throughout our head and neck, many lymph nodes, uh, you know, at regularly spaced intervals um, within those vessels. And if you look at letter C, your lymph nodes, we have lymph nodes um, in a cervical area, the axillary area, popliteal, inguinal, thoracic, abdominal, many, many lymph nodes. Um, we have several places that, where they are superficial. So we have superficial nodes in the cervical region, so our neck, the axillary region, and our inguinal regions. And then we have deeper nodes that we cannot feel. You should not be able to feel your lymph nodes. They are not uh, palpable um, if you do not have an infection. When you do have an infection, what happens is these lymph nodes will swell. The superficial ones will become palpable. So you can actually feel swollen lymph nodes under the skin for just those superficial areas. And lymph nodes will swell um, according to their local infection. So if this woman had an ear infection, for example, the lymph nodes around her ear might be swollen, but not the lymph nodes around her eye. However, if she had an eye infection, you might have swollen lymph nodes around her eye, but then it wouldn't be swollen anywhere else. So when you have swollen lymph nodes, it indicates a local infection to that area. So if you ever go to the doctor and they feel your neck and they're, um, you know, you say, oh, I have a sore throat or I'm not feeling very well, they might palpate around your neck in this area, right? So they're feeling for swollen lymph nodes because that tells the doctor that you have an active infection, right? If you have a, a sore throat, well, you have an infection, your lymph nodes are swollen. All right, so let's take a look at this. So capsule, all right, now let's take a look at the, um, actually I have a few more pictures for you. So this is the image of the head and neck. So drainage of lymph from the head and neck. Then we have our axillary lymph nodes here. So we have lymph nodes down the arm, a lot of lymph nodes in the axillary region. We have superficial ones there. And I wanna take a moment to talk about um, breast cancer and 
why um, breast exams have you palpate in your armpit. And it's because of these lymph nodes. So if you had a cancer cell um, and a cancer cell were to metastasize or to spread through the body, knowing what you know now about the anatomy of a lymphatic capillary and a blood capillary, which capillary is going to be an easier route for that cancer cell to enter? It's going to be the lymphatic capillary, right? Because the lymphatic capillaries are held open and they want those larger cells to enter it so they can be screened. So if a woman is screening herself for um, breast cancer, you are told to palpate around the breast tissue itself, right? Because we're looking for lumps for the, in the breast itself, but you're also asked to palpate up further to the armpit, the axillary region, because if a cancer cell were to break off and enter into the lymphatic vessel, they're going to be routed into these um, lymphatic vessels that travel through the axillary region, and they'll probably get caught within a lymph node, right? So because these lymph nodes are full, again, of white blood cells, and the cancer cell will most likely stop uh, within a lymph node, and then it might actually grow into a little tumor within a lymph node. So that's the reason why breast exams have you go all around the breast, not just the breast tissue itself, but also a little bit higher up and also into the armpit. Because if there's um, some metastasis, you know, if there's a metastasis happening, uh, it would um, most likely be caught in these axillary lymph nodes. So you're looking for any lumps or abnormalities there. And then we have here, we have superficial uh, inguinal lymph nodes. So people who have um, maybe a sexually transmitted infection or they have a bladder infection may have uh, swollen lymph nodes here. And um, this finally, actually this is the, where we can see this again. Remember your femoral triangle. This is the last picture I think I'm ever gonna show this femoral triangle. But now we can see the lymph nodes, right? So remember that um, N-A-V-E-L, the navel, the femoral nerve, the artery, the vein, and now we can see the lymph nodes. So this is our lymph nodes that are with, found within their femoral triangle. Okay, so <laughs> now we can actually see that. All right, so let's take a look at um, the lymph nodes. So you're going to be responsible for identifying uh, a diagram of a lymph node and um, the things that are very important I haven't read. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and start it. So lymph nodes, if you look under number one, they have a capsule, okay? A capsule is dense connective tissue. So it's bound, all the softer cells, uh, the soft tissue in here, it's bound by tough connective tissue called the capsule. The capsule will create little ridges inside. So they have little compartments and those inward projections of the capsule, those are called trabeculae. Um, Let's see what else is in your notes here. I do mention that you have in your body lymph nodes, which is what you're looking at, and then you also have something called lymph nodules. Nodules I'll mention at the end of the lecture, but they don't have any connective tissue capsules. So a nodule would just be a collection of these white blood cells and this kind of cellular material in here without the capsule. That's the difference. Okay, so lymph is usually free of pathogens by the time it leaves the last lymph node and enters into your venous system, into your veins. So number two, these are all the structures you want to recognize. Again, we have a hilum, right? Like our lungs had a hilum. This is a dented region where we have an entrance and exit of blood vessels and also this efferent vessel. Let's take a look at this. So the vessels that bring lymph into a lymph node, right, are called afferent, A. Afferent vessels come into the uh, lymph node. There's many of them, and there's only one efferent vessel, E for exit, okay? Only one of these guys. So think about traffic. If you have four or five lanes of traffic, and all of a sudden there's only one lane of traffic, then what happens to traffic? It gets backed up. So that's literally what's going on here. So the fluid is coming into the lymph node, and it's backing up, it's slowing down, because the job of the lymph node is to screen all these black dots here, those, rec those represent white blood cells, uh, B cells and T cells, and also different kinds of cells. So in order for them to be able to detect and get stimulated by a pathogen, um, those materials will have to be very slowly moving through the lymph node. So you can't just whip by a white blood cell and expect that white blood cell to capture it. 
So that's the, um, the mechanism here. So the lymph will slow down as it moves through a lymph node. There's only one exit. And so it allows that fluid, that lymph to, to slow down. Um, all right, we talked about capsule. Cortex and medulla. So the word cortex and medulla, you're gonna see that a lot because different organs have a cortex and medulla. Cortex means the outer portion and medulla means the inner portion. So let's take a look at the two words here. So cortex is pointing to the here, but really it's just all of this outer portion. See this black dotted line? It's everything outside of that dotted line is the cortex. The medulla is everything sort of inside, is the inner part of the um, organ. So the medulla just means the inner portion. The lymph nodes divided into outer cortex and deep cortex. So the outer cortex is the portion above the dotted line here. And in this little area between the dotted lines, we're calling that the deep cortex where we have a population of T cells. So when lymph enters a lymph node, it first encounters a lot of B cells and then it comes into the deeper cortex where it encounters a lot of T cells. So basically alphabetical order, right? B first, then T, and then it's gonna move through and then exit. There's a, a more than just B and T cells here. It's much more complicated than that, but for general purposes, right? We just wanna know B and T cells. Now, um, notice that our B and T cells create kind of a triangle with a pale center in the middle. Um, I think I have a better picture of that here. That pale center is called the germinal center, right? So here's your outer cortex um, in the germinal center. This germinal center, what germinal means is reproduction, right? So a B cell or a T cell that has encountered its, um, its antigen, it's, it's stimulated, it will make many, many clones of itself. So that one stimulated cell will start to form an army of the clones. And so that reproduction is gonna be found in the germinal center, okay? So that's why it's called the germinal center, but it's gonna be, it looks pale compared to the population of your T and B cells. Let's look at an actual lymph node. So you should be able to recognize a histology slide of a lymph node and it's, it's pretty, uh, the telltale sign of a lymph node are these germinal centers. So you have a round structure here. The dark band will be your lymphocytes, your T and B cells. And then the pale center, of course, is your germinal center, right? The word germinal centers right here. So you're gonna have, so notice, you see how these are all um, on the edge? So these are all located in the cortex or the outer portion of the lymphatic, the lymph node. The medulla is the inner part of that lymph node. The direction, the green is telling you the direction of lymph as lymph flows through the lymph node and has one efferent vessel exiting the lymph node. Okay, so just recognize that this is a lymph node, that this pale area is a germinal center, and uh, the region is called a nodule, if you wanna remember that, but I don't usually ask you what a nodule is but knowing that this is a germinal center. Okay. Um, so there is a um, cancer of your lymph nodes, and this is, this is called um, lymphoma. So lymphoma is, um, there's two kinds. There's Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, and the, the difference is very um, particular. It's very um, sort of... Um, I don't, I don't know what the word is, but it's very specific differences. But really what lymphoma is in both types is uh, a cancer of your lymph nodes. And so you can see how large the lymph nodes can actually get. Uh, and it affects the cells of your lymphatic system. They multiply uncontrollably, which is what cancer is. Um, and they may extend to areas outside the lymphatic system. Okay, so if you have a very large swollen lymph node and you don't really know why, it might be a sign of um, lymphoma. And the good news is lymphoma is one of the most treatable kinds of cancers. I actually have a friend who had lymphoma and has been cancer free for years now. So it's, it's a, a cancer that responds very well to, uh, to therapy. All right, so I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, I'll put this link on your module if you wanna take a look at a lymph node video.
And I think that's all I have for lymph nodes. Yes. 